According to St. Luke. When the hour for the Passover meal came, Jesus took his place at the table and the apostles with him. He said to them, I have eagerly desired to eat this Passover with you before I suffer. For I tell you, I will not eat it until it is fulfilled in the kingdom of God. Then he took a cup and after giving thanks, he said, Take this and divide it among yourselves. For I tell you that from now on, I will not drink of the fruit of the vine until the kingdom of God comes. Then he took a loaf of bread, and when he had given thanks, he broke it and gave it to them, saying, This is my body, which is given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. And he did the same with the cup after supper, saying, This cup that is poured out for you is the new covenant in my blood. But see, the one who betrays me is with me, and his hand is on the table. For the Son of Man is going as it has been determined, but woe to that one by whom he is betrayed. Then they began to ask one another which one of them it could be who would do this. A dispute also arose among them as to which one of them was to be regarded as the greatest. But he said to them, the kings of the Gentiles lorded over them, and those in authority over them are called benefactors. But not so with you. Rather, the greatest among you must become like the youngest, and the leader like one who serves. For who is greater, the one who is at the table or the one who serves? Is it not the one at the table? But I am among you as one who serves. You are those who have stood by me in my trials, and I confer on you, just as my Father has conferred on me, a kingdom, so that you may eat and drink at my table, in my kingdom, and you will sit on thrones, judging the twelve tribes of Israel. Simon, Simon, listen. Satan has demanded to sift all of you like wheat, but I have prayed for you, that your own faith may not fail, and you when once you have turned back, strengthen your brothers. Lord, I am ready to go with you to person and to death. I tell you, Peter, the cock will not crow this day until you have denied three times that you know me. When I sent you out without a purse, bag, or sandals, did you lack anything? <laughs> but now, the one who has a purse must take it, and likewise a bag. And the one who has no sword must sell his cloak and buy one. For I tell you, this scripture must be fulfilled in me. And he was counted among the lawless. And indeed, what is written about me is being fulfilled. It is enough. He came out and went, as was his custom, to the Mount of Olives, and the disciples followed him. When he reached the place, he said to them, Pray that you may not come into the time of trial. Then he withdrew from them about a stone's throw, knelt down, and prayed, Father, if you are willing, remove this cup from me. Yet not my will, but yours be done. Then an angel from heaven appeared to him and gave him strength. In his anguish, he prayed more earnestly, and his sweat became like great drops of blood falling down on the ground. When he got up from prayer, he came to the disciples and found them sleeping because of their grief. And he said to them, Why are you sleeping? Get up and pray that you may not come into the time of trial. While he was still speaking, suddenly a crowd came, and the one called Judas one of the twelve was leading them. He approached Jesus to kiss him, but Jesus said to him, Judas, is it with a kiss 
that you are betraying the Son of Man? When those who were around him saw what was coming, they asked, Lord, should we strike with the sword? Then one of them struck the slave of the high priest and cut off his right ear. But Jesus said, No more of this. And he touched his ear and healed him. Then Jesus said to the chief priests, the officers of the temple police, and the elders who had come for him, Have you come out with swords and clubs as if I were a bandit? When I was with you day after day in the temple, you did not lay hands on me. But this is your hour and the power of darkness. Then they seized him and led him away, bringing him into the high priest's house. But Peter was following at a distance. When they had kindled a fire in the middle of the courtyard and sat down together, Peter sat among them. Then a servant girl, seeing him in the firelight, stared at him and said, This man also was with him. But he denied it, saying, Woman, I do not know him. A little later, someone else on seeing him said, You also are one of them. Man, I am not. Then about an hour later still, another kept insisting, Surely this man also was with him, for he is a Galilean. Man, I do not know what you are talking about. At that moment, while he was still speaking, the cock crowed. The, word, the Lord turned and looked at Peter. <coughs> then Peter remembered the word of the Lord, how he had said to him, before the cock crows today, you will deny me three times. And he went out and wept bitterly. Now the men who were holding Jesus began to mock him and to beat him. They also blindfolded him and kept asking him. They kept heaping many other insults. When day came, the assembly of the elders of the people, both chief priests and scribes, gathered together, and they brought him to their council. They said, If you are the Messiah, tell us. If I tell you, you will not believe. And if I question you, you will not answer. But from now on, the Son of Man will be seated at the right hand of the power of God. All of them asked, you say that I am. Then the assembly rose as a body and brought Jesus before Pilate. They began to accuse him, saying, Are you the king of the Jews? You say so. Then Pilate said to the chief priests and the crowds, I find no basis for an accusation against this man. But they were insistent and said, When Pilate heard this, he asked whether the man was Galilean. And when he learned that he was under Herod's jurisdiction, he sent him off to Herod, who was himself in Jerusalem at that time. When Herod saw Jesus, he was very glad, for he had been waiting and wanting to see him for a long time, because he had heard about him and was hoping to see him perform some sign. He questioned him at some length, but Jesus gave him no answer. The chief priests and the scribes stood by, vehemently <coughs> accusing him. Even Herod, with his soldiers, treated him with contempt and mocked him. Then he put an elegant robe on him and sent him back to Pilate. The same day, Herod and Pilate became friends with each other. Before this, they had been enemies. Pilate then called together the chief priests, the leaders, and the people and said to them, You brought me this man as one who was perverting the people. And here I have examined him in your presence and have not found this man guilty of any of your charges against him. Neither is Herod, for he had sent him back to us. Indeed, he has done nothing to deserve death. I will therefore have him flogged and release him. Then they all shouted out together, Away, 
This was a man who had been put in prison for an insurrection that had taken place in the city and for murder. Pilate, wanting to release Jesus, addressed them again, but they kept saying, <coughs> A third time he said to them, Why? What evil has he done? I found him in no ground for the sentence of death. I will therefore have him flogged and then release him. But they kept urgently demanding with loud shouts that he could be crucified, and their voices prevailed. So Pilate gave his verdict that their demand should be granted. He released the man they asked for, the one who had been put in prison for insurrection and murder. And they handed Jesus over as they wished. As they led him away, they seized the man, Simon of Cyrene, who was coming from the country. They laid the cross on him and made him carry it behind Jesus. A great number of people followed, and among them were women who were beating their breasts and wailing for him. But Jesus turned to them and said, Daughters of Jerusalem, do not weep for me, but weep for yourselves and for your children. For the days are surely coming when they will say, Blessed are the barren and the wounds that never bore and the breasts that never nursed. Then they will begin to say to the mountains, Fall on us. And to the hills, cover us. For if they do this when the wood is green, what will happen when it is dry? Two others also, who were criminals, were led away to put to death with him. When they came to the place that is called the skull, they crucified Jesus there with the criminals, one on his right and one on his left. Then Jesus said, Father, forgive them, for they do not know what they are doing. And they cast lots to divide his clothing, and the people stood by watching. But the leaders scoffed at him, saying, You save others, let him save himself, if he is the Messiah of God, the children of The soldiers also mocked him, coming up and offering him sour wine, and saying, if you are king of Jews, save yourself. There was also an inscription over him, This is the king of the Jews. Now one of the criminals who were hanged there kept deriding him and saying, Are you not the Messiah? Save yourself and us. But the other rebuked him, saying, Do you not fear God, since you are under the same sentence of condemnation? And indeed, he had been for we are getting what I deserve for our deeds, but this man has done nothing wrong. Jesus, remember me when you come into your kingdom. Truly I tell you, today you will be with me in paradise. It was now about noon, and darkness came over the whole land until three in the afternoon. While the sun's light failed, and the curtain of the temple was torn in two. Then Jesus, crying with a loud voice, said, Father, into your hands I commend my spirit. Having said this, he breathed his last. When the centurion saw what had taken place, he praised God and said, And when all the crowds who had gathered there for this spectacle saw what had taken place, they returned home, beating their breasts. But all his acquaintances, including the women who had followed him from Galilee, stood at a distance, watching these things. Now there was a good and righteous man named Joseph, who, though a member of the council, had not agreed to their plan and action. He came from the Jewish town of Arimathea, and he was waiting expectantly for the kingdom of God. This man went to Pilate and asked for the body of Jesus. Then he took it down, wrapped it in a linen cloth, and laid it in a rock-hewn tomb where no one had ever been laid. It was the day of preparation, and the Sabbath was beginning. The women who had come with him from Galilee followed 
and they saw the tomb and how his body was laid. Then they returned and prepared spices and ointments. On the Sabbath, they rested according to the commandment. Please be seated. Please bow with me in prayer. Lord, take my lips and speak through them. Take our minds and think through them. Take our hearts and set them on fire with love for your Son, Jesus Christ, in whose name we pray. Amen. Amen. We do have a few visitors today, so I want to uh, tell you what we've been doing during the season of Lent, and we're c continuing the sermon series. Uh, through the Sunday after Easter, and we're entitling it Transitions. And if you look in the Old Testament, the New Testament, many figures uh, that came to know the Lord and would walk with the Lord went through transitions in their life. And some of them experienced a real ro roller coaster ride as they went through these transitions. Today, on Palm Sunday, we experience kind of a roller coaster ride. In one morning, we go from Palm Sunday, where we're singing Hosanna, and then as the service progresses, then we move to the Passion Gospel reading and Jesus dying on the cross. And so the emotion and the thoughts and what you're experiencing in your faith during the course of this service is a roller coaster ride in many ways, but it's what many people have experienced in the Lord and with their encounter with the world. Because as you go through the challenges of this life, the struggles, the pain, the joys, you go through a roller coaster ride. It's part of our lives as human beings. But when you're walking with the Lord, that doesn't exempt you from that. And so one of the people that I decided to focus on today, particularly since he was there the whole time, is the Apostle John. Because John is the only apostle that didn't flee the Lord. He was in the courts. And he saw what Jesus went through. He probably even observed him getting tortured. And he was the only apostle at the cross. And so John is probably the most appropriate figure to focus on today. And John's an interesting person. Because if you don't know much about John and you go through John's gospel and what was written about John and the apostles... John started off, and he tells you this early in his gospel, that he was probably one of the earliest followers of Jesus, and that he was known as a son of Zebedee. And he fished with his brother, and probably his father, his brother James, who was also an apostle, one of the early disciples. And then they were a team with Peter and Andrew, also brothers. What's also interesting about John in the early part of his life is he was known as a son of thunder. That makes you wonder if Zebedee was like the thunder and they were the sons or whether James and John were troublemakers in their earlier life. We don't know for sure, but there's a good chance that he probably wasn't a calm, sedate, quiet person. He was a fisherman and one of his buddies was Peter and even though Peter had the reputation of being the big mouth and putting his foot in his mouth and making all kinds of mistakes along the way, John obviously also had a certain reputation earlier in his life. So it's interesting because on the one hand he's a fisherman, which fishermen had the reputation of being rough around the edges. And John had an additional reputation. But at the same time, what we see later is he has access to the courts, to the Sanhedrin. He probably was the guy who maybe sold fish to the high priest's home. So he kind of walked in various circles and was able to connect with a variety of people. And John, on the other hand, seemed to have a wonderful spirit, which comes through in his writings. You know, John wrote five books in the New Testament. He wrote the Gospel according to John. He wrote the three letters, 1 John, 2 John, 3 John. And he also wrote the book of Revelation. And during that time, probably in the latter part of his life, he went through different 
aspects of our faith when it comes to the various writings that he did write. For example, in his gospel, his gospel is so different than the other three gospels. If you've ever read through the various gospels, you would notice that Mark and Matthew and Luke all look similar. And I said Mark first because his was probably the earliest. It probably came from the lips of Peter, as Mark described the gospel. And then Mark and Matthew also wrote, for different reasons, their gospels. They all had reasons for writing what they wrote, but they all were very, very similar. They're called the synoptics because sin is the same prefix as synonym, similar. And optic because they looked similar. Then you get to John's gospel. John's gospel is completely different. And I think there's a reason for that. John wrote at the end of his life, toward the end of his life. The other three gospels had probably been around since somewhere between 60 and 65. They wanted to get the word out. They wanted to put down on paper what people were learning about the life and ministry and words of Jesus, his teaching and preaching. And John didn't write his gospel till probably sometime in the 90s, almost 30 years later. And John had walked with Jesus on the face of the earth for three years, in the flesh, and then for 30 years in the spirit. So he had this wealth of experience, and toward the end of his life, as he was writing this gospel, there's a good chance that he constructed it in a similar way to, for example, I put together sermons for memorial services and funerals. Because John's gospel comes across as having kind of two main things going on in it. The first is, there's long stories in John's gospel, longer than any other gospel. For example, you've got the story with Nicodemus and the interaction with Nicodemus in John 3. Then you get to John 4, you've got the interaction with the woman at the well. By the time you get to John 9, you've got the man born blind and all that happened around that. Then when you get to John 13 through 17, which is the upper room with the apostles. It's the longest time we see Jesus interacting with his apostles and sharing his teaching. It's the longest teaching we have on the person of the Holy Spirit. And so what you see in John are these anecdotal stories that really depict the person and the character and the compassion of Jesus. But what you also see, which we often do with people when we think about people, is themes in their life. Now think about people in your life that you would say, you know, they're really, really sweet and they're really, really kind. Or they just have a wonderful sense of humor. Or they're always trying to help people. I mean, you think of themes when you think of people. You might even think they're jerks, but you don't, usually don't do that, at least out loud. But we do think of people with themes in mind when we reflect on them. And that's what John does. Because if you look at the very beginning of his gospel, he talks about light and darkness. And he talks about Jesus being life. And life and death is certainly one of the themes. You see spirit and flesh. You see sight and blindness. You see the spirit which brings water and, and refreshment and life and desert and dry. I mean, the themes are throughout, including, I might add, love, which is a huge theme with John, not only in his gospel, but in his letters. For God so loved the world that he gave his only son, one of the verses that we think of often when we think of the gospel. And yet at the same time, when he's instructing his apostles in the upper room, he said, the world will hate you because the world hates me. So he talks about that contrast, which is really important for us to be aware of. He wanted his apostles to be aware of the world is not always going to think you're wonderful. They certainly don't think I'm, a, I'm wonderful all the time. And so when John gets to this theme of love in the gospel, you see that contrast. But then go to his letters. I mean, over and over again, you see in his first letter, God is love. He who abides in love abides in God and God in him. You see the theme of love throughout that, but you're also seeing in the midst of his letters the fact that the church is being persecuted. 
You also see in the midst of the letters that the churches are facing heresies, false teaching. And so you've got all that going on with John, and then you get to Revelation, and there's all kinds of stuff going on in Revelation, which we're not going to go into at all today. But I mean, this is John. John, on the one hand, is quite simple. But he's also complicated like us. John seems to have had, in many ways, a steady path. But it doesn't mean that he didn't have a roller coaster ride, particularly since he was the one apostle at the cross. And what he saw. So I want to talk about John in his early life. We don't know a whole lot outside of he was a fisherman and he was a son of thunder. That's about all we know. If you look at Da Vinci's Last Supper, and by the way, Da Vinci didn't have a camera or photograph, so he doesn't really know. But the reputation of John is that he was the youngest. He was probably in many ways, at least from Da Vinci's depiction, the most innocent, and probably because he had the reputation of being so loving. We do know that there's a good chance that he may have known John the Baptist, and he may have even been around at Jesus' baptism. Because he becomes one of the early disciples. Not only does he become an early disciple along with his brother James, along with Peter and Andrew, but he becomes one of the inner circle, like Peter, the inner three. There's James and John and Peter that get invited to special aspects of Jesus' life and ministry. For example, when Jesus raised the little girl, it was those three with him. When Jesus was on the Mount of Transfiguration, it was Peter, James, and John with him. And it's interesting because at Jesus' baptism, you hear certain words that you hear repeated at the Transfiguration. This is my son, the beloved. So think about John having that seed planted. That Jesus is the beloved of the Father. So that by the time you get to the Garden of Gethsemane, and Jesus says to Peter, James, and John, please pray with me. And John's heart probably is broken because he fell asleep. So his heart's being tenderized. But this notion of Jesus being the beloved had to have stuck with him. Because when Jesus is hanging on the cross, John refers to himself as the beloved disciple. When Jesus says, John, this is your mother, referring to Mary. And Mary, mom, this is your son. That Jesus was so focused and fixed on the care of his mother, even on the cross, and the love and compassion he had, that he considered all the possible people in his life that could have taken over. His brothers and sisters who didn't believe in him the other apostles who weren't at the cross. And he said, John, because you're so faithful, you're the one to take care of my mom. And we're told he took her in his care from then on. But then three more times by the end of John's gospel, John refers to himself, John 20 and 21, as the beloved disciple. Now, you know, just to pause for a second, does that mean he was more special than anyone else? No. Because Jesus doesn't refer to him as the beloved disciple. John does refer to himself as the beloved disciple. Why? Because he was Jesus' favorite? He has no favorites. You know, favoritism got people into trouble in some of the Old Testament stories. You know, I, I've told this story before. It bears repeating. I just love it. You know... I, I play golf with this foursome, and sometimes we have subs, but we got four of us regulars on Thursday afternoons. And when we play sometimes, you know, periodically, one of us will hit a tree. Okay? Imagine that. And mine, more often than not, will bounce into the fairway. Theirs, more often or not, will go into an unplayable lie or out of bounds. 
So, you know, one time I said to the one guy that had happened to, I turned to him and I said, you just need to know Jesus loves you, but I'm his favorite. (laughs) Someone got me a shirt that says that. I don't wear it very often because I don't like to brag. No, just kidding. (laughs) But the reality is, is that he doesn't have favorites. But when we come to the understanding of who Jesus is and what he's done for us, John, more than anyone, when he was at the cross, understood the depth of Jesus' love. Because Jesus had explained to them, I'm going to the cross for you, to die for your sin. That's why I'm going. So that you understand my love. John understood it. So that by the time Easter Sunday rolls around and Peter and John race to the tomb that when John sees the empty tomb he says I believe he didn't have to see the risen Lord Jesus he said I believe because Jesus said it I know I know So when he saw Jesus in the upper room with the other apostles, he wasn't surprised because he knew. Why did he know? Because he knew the depth of love that God has for him. That's why. And it was because of the cross. What he knew on Easter Sunday is Jesus also had the power to defeat sin and death in our lives. Which in its latter years, That's what comes out in his letters. That's what comes out in the book of Revelation. That even though you're going through persecution, even though you're facing false teaching, what you need to trust is the cross of Jesus Christ and the power of the resurrection. You need to trust when God says something and when he makes his promises in his word, you can believe that. That's what John knew. That's why John never wavered. Never wavered. And as time would go on, not only did John have the reputation in the church of being the eldest, he writes in his letters from the elder. Why does he write it? Most of the apostles, based on tradition, were probably martyred by the 60s. Maybe a little later. And John was the only uh, apostle that was never martyred and lived into the 90s. So John referred to himself as the elder. He was the elder statesman of the church. And he had an impact on the early church fathers as they're known. Guys like Polycarp and Irenaeus and Ignatius that would then go on to continue to write for the church, defend the church in the face of heresies, and pass along the faith. That they could say, I wasn't around for Jesus, but I met John. And John had an impact on people. John, in his latter years, he was exiled to Patmos. Why they never martyred him? Well, Jesus said they wouldn't in John 21. We don't know because all the rest of them were expendable. But for some reason, there was something about John, the depth of his love, maybe the sweetness of his spirit, We don't know. But he was exiled in his latter years. John never stopped. In his early years, when he began, he always grew. He grew in the knowledge and love of the Lord. He walked for three years with Jesus in the flesh and 30 years in the spirit with Jesus and never stopped. And it continues to have an impact today because he never stopped. That's what the Lord wants for us too. John could have stopped, by the way. If you read Acts 3 and 4, John was persecuted, he was beaten, he stayed faithful, he kept preaching. I mean, at one point he and Peter said, when they were told to be silent, Whether we should listen to you or God, there's really no option here. We're going to listen to God. 
So he faced persecution. By the time you get to Acts chapter 12, his brother James was beheaded. He was one of the inner three. He was the first of the apostles to die. He didn't stop. He took care of Mary, most believe in Ephesus. And so he moved out. He went from being the disciple who followed Jesus to the apostle who, the word apostle means sent one. He went out. We don't know all of what John did in his ministry, but we know he never stopped. You know, I thought about John's life and what he did with his life. And what came to mind is three M's. If you don't remember anything else I said, because I've been doing a lot of teaching this morning. I want you to remember three M's. Just remember the company, you know? The first is model. John was a model. He was a model of persistence, perseverance, constancy, and love. Which the Lord desires for all of us as we walk by the Spirit. Secondly, he lived into the mandates of the Lord. And the reason I chose the word mandate is twofold. Number one, this coming Thursday, we're going to be remembering on Monday, Thursday. It's what the word Monday is based on, mandate. Two mandates that Jesus gave at the Last Supper. A lot of people tend to focus on one, but it almost depends on what gospel or gospels you're going to focus on. Because in the synoptic gospels, what you have is the institution of the Last Supper, where Jesus talks about the bread and the wine, and he says, do this in remembrance of me. You know, John's gospel never does that. John's gospel talks about washing feet before dinner, and then he talks about after dinner. The other gospels had already talked about it. That practice was already instilled in the church. So John focused on another mandate that Jesus gave at the Last Supper. Love one another as I have loved you, which is the focus of John's life and ministry. Love one another as I've loved you. What did Jesus do? He washed feet. Then what did he do after supper? The next day, he laid down his life. And he talked about greater love has no one than they lay down their life for the friend. And you are my friends. And John lived into the mandate of being a worshiping man and a praying man and a man who cared about people and fellowship. He lived into the first mandate, but the second mandate, love one another as I have loved you that a lot of people have good intentions about, but they really never make that commitment. To really love as Jesus loves. Because if his Holy Spirit penetrates your heart like it did John, because of the cross and the resurrection, you will love. And the third M is the most. Make the most out of your life. God's given you gifts and talents and ability. He has given you different character than people around you. You're a mix different than anybody else. But God can make the most of who you are if you let him. If you let him. If that's the intention of your life, to make the most and do the most you can for the sake of the Lord, to love him and to love other people. In your mind, when you know the Lord that deeply, you too will think of yourself as the beloved disciple. Let's pray. Lord God, we thank you for the witness and testimony of John's life for his constancy and commitment, for his faithfulness, for the depth of his love, because of the depth of your love that he experienced and saw and passed along. Lord God, we pray this day that as we approach Holy Week, we remember the mandates that you gave. We remember the gift you gave. 
that Jesus died on the cross in our place for our sin. That we would too know the depth. We would too know the love. We would too commit to being a model and following your mandates and make the most of our lives and allow the power of the resurrection to bolster us and strengthen us, the power of the Holy Spirit to move in us and through us. And we pray this for this day and for the rest of our lives. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen.